If you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. If you're scientifically literate, the world looks very different to you. It's not just a lot of mysterious things happening. There's a lot we understand out there. And that understanding empowers you. If you base medicine on science, you cure people. If you base the design of planes on science, they fly. If you base the design of rockets on science, they reach the moon. It works, bitches. And welcome to a really radio science portion. Uh, okay, so Amber, <clears throat> since you're the new blood and you put a put a story in here for us, let's go to the New York Post. The mystery of the Bermuda Triangle may finally be solved. What's going on here? Uh, well, what they're saying now is that um, there's these hexagonal cloud formations that appear over the area where the Bermuda Triangle is supposed to be. Um, and they're linked to 170 mile per hour air bombs is what they're calling them. And they're capable of bringing down planes and tipping over ships. Whoa. They are, each cloud is between 20 and 50 miles wide. Um, they form over that particular patch of water. Um, they had a meteorologist, uh, Dr. Randy Cerveni, who was saying that the satellite imagery is really bizarre. The hexagonal shapes of the cloud formations um, are in essence air bombs. They're formed by what is called microbursts and they're just blasts of air. Wow. And those definitely wouldn't show up on any guidance radar or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Not that not that most of the planes that, that went down like in the in the forties and fifties and, and earlier, uh, they didn't have any guidance at all anyway, so they were just flying by uh, visual. No, and mm -hmm. a hundred and seventy mile per hour burst of wind yeah. would be so quick that by the time you're able to recover or actually call out for any kind of assistance or, you know, that that's one of those things where a lot of the times you don't even hear about it until the ship's just gone or the plane mm -hmm. is just missing. Um, you know, that might be why that's a very good reason where you have no time <laughs> to respond because all yeah. of a sudden it's, Oh, everything's nice and calm to 170 miles right in your face. Now this doesn't explain anything about like, you know, Oh no! All the avionics are weird, and there's some weird magnetic thing going on, and and all that. Uh, this is just a physical weather phenomenon. Yeah, um, that's that's what they're saying. Now, my my absolute conjecture would be that it is possible for some navigational systems to maybe be skewed a bit by the formation of these completely weird, you know, anom. An anomalies mm -hmm. that are uh, going on. Uh, not all of them. There is obviously some kind of, if the tales are to be believed, some kind of electromagnetic element to it. But um, I mean, it, it it definitely would explain why, you know, like like you were saying, um, there's there's no time to call for help when you've just been smacked by 170 yeah. <laughs> miles per hour of. of air you know you're you're done if you're in a especially if you're in like you know a, a, one of the smaller planes and flying that's, that's it. under you're the gone. clouds yeah and flying mm -hmm. under the clouds if you fly above the clouds obviously this is this is a different phenomenon you wouldn't wouldn't get the microburst the downburst mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah which is there's a number of modern air disasters that have been related to microbursts mm -hmm. because of even big jets flying through storms and just it's suddenly wind hitting from multiple directions or just one massive blast of wind that just completely throws the plane. So wait, now th these are also between 20 and 50 miles wide of yes. air just dropping on a plane. So it's not like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a little gust on the wing. No, it's an entire gust on the plane mm -hmm. for miles and miles and miles. Yeah, that's wreckage is what it is. That's, yeah. Okay. So that's this a, is that's a significant being find. Pissed. That's a significant find. And apparently there's also something about uh, uh, digging a little deeper here. This is actually also uh, out on Science Channel. And, you know, they don't always just report on, like, ancient aliens. Sometimes they actually do some good stuff th these days. Uh, but apparently there's also uh, this phenomenon is also seen on the other side of the world, too. So in some of the hexagonal uh, shaped clouds. And we've also seen these on uh, hexagonal clouds formations on uh, Saturn on the top of Saturn. So this is, it's, it's a thing that happens. It's mm -hmm. just a little weird. That's neat. Okay. 
So if we hear anything more about uh, microburst patterns or anything like that, then you will you will find it here, and you can find links to everything that we're talking about in the show notes available out at oreallyradio.com. Uh, we're going to have all those listed, and uh, if you've downloaded the podcast, it will be in the show note information uh, right there, and you can just click through. All right, so moving right along, scientists say they have identified the physical source of depression in the brain. I, uh, I pulled this one from Science Alert. Um, let's see. So the region of the brain that serves as the physical source of feeling of depression has been identified. New MRI data uh, being the latest evidence showed depression isn't just a frame of mind. Um, now, this is going. This is a fairly long article, and then it gets into different portions of the brain with names like OFC four seven dash no slash twelve underscore R. <laughs> so the uh, medial orbital frontal cortex system and things like of that nature are probably going to be beyond most of us. Just going to go ahead and put that out there. So. I just want wanted this to be something that enters your mind, knowing that, oh, look, all those people out there that say it's just in your head, just work through that depression. Yeah, you can tell them they're <laughs> full of shit for me, okay? Because that's just wrong. Um, it is something, it, you know, whether it be a a chemical difference in the way that you're you're wired up, basically, or, oh, look, a physical sign of something in your brain. At least now we're seeing it, and we could actually do something about it. So th- this is this is really important. And also saying, you know, mental illness of, of any kind, depression, anxiety, bipolar, what have you, it's all in your head. It's like saying, well, diabetes is all in your pancreas. Or nice. your, your cancer is all in your lungs. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> that's That's a problem. That gout, me, yeah. that gout is all in your toe. Just walk it off. <laughs> Damn, I've got <laughs> lung cancer in my toe. <laughs> I don't know how it got there, but just um, just it, walk it off, buddy. It walk metastasized. It off. That's how it how it got yeah. there because you ignored it when it was in your lungs. Exactly, <laughs> because people told you it was just in your head. So yeah. <laughs> your lung cancer is only in your head. It's only in your head. Yeah, in your hippocampus. Or it's something. not yeah. a tumor. It's not. A, no, it is a tumor. It is. In fact, a tumor. <laughs> so you can uh, you can dig in as much as you want on that. Uh, it's it's just it's boring radio to really go over all that <laughs> unless that's unless this is a true hard science podcast. And I don't feel like I'm, I'm not up to that tonight. So we're, we'll move along from that. But you can definitely find that and uh, and dig in. It's it's good information to have. So also now this this we might dig into a little bit. This is a phenomenal headline. Yeah. It, it, this so is this is the headline. This is the start of a horror movie. <laughs> horror movie? I've no. seen Dead Snow. <sighs> <sighs> I take this an entirely no. different way. This is this is the happiest of accidents. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this many things that you, you know those eureka moments, you scientists don't say eureka in the lab. They go Oh, what's that? Yeah, that was not supposed to happen. That's weird. <laughs> Quick, <laughs> you know, publish it. Yeah, whenever you whenever you hear that from your lab partner, that's when you say, what'd you find? What's going on? <laughs> Researchers accidentally turned carbon dioxide into ethanol. Ethanol, by the way, is something you can burn. It's fuel. So we can take the stuff that's coming out of our tailpipes and turn it back into fuel. Instead of a poison that's helping yeah, to destroy our climate. Not, not exactly a carbon negative solution, but it might be more carbon neutral. <laughs> At least we could work on that. Science has a long storied history of looking for one thing but finding something better instead. Penicillin, radioactivity, science boxes. I mean, microwave ovens. Uh, all these discoveries <laughs> came in the search for something else. On Monday, researchers at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee announced that they had too, unfortunately, uh, they too had unintentionally discovered something incredible a means of transforming carbon dioxide directly into ethanol using a single catalyst. That's. Huge. I mean, because 
going through like multiple steps that yeah okay you can turn all sorts of things into something else but a single catalyst in one step yeah that's the kind of thing that you put into the car to suck off the carbon dioxide and put it right back in your gas tank or just immediately burn it right right there you know kind of like the let's take that catalytic converter and make it really do some work for you uh, the team was already looking for a way to convert CO2 into, into ethanol, but were convinced that doing so would require multiple steps and catalysts. Turns out they were wrong. system is surprisingly simple. Uh, it's a, cre- a, a, a tiny array of nanoscale copper and carbon spikes mounted on a silicon surface. A nano droplet of nitrogen sits at the tip of each point. When exposed to carbon dioxide and a small electrical charge, this catalyst catalyst sets off a complex chain reaction that essentially reverses the combustion process. Reverses the combustion process. I just want to highlight that right there. And converts the gas into liquid ethanol. What's more, because the catalyst is so small, there's virtually no side reaction, so the ethanol is quite pure. You, you I, know I don't think I can me. emphasize enough how miraculous this is. This is wonderful. But you know what this tells me? For those people who, don't, who aren't as up on astronomy as I am, mm-hmm. the atmosphere of Venus is 96.5 <laughs> carbon dioxide. I think Venus needs some freedom. You're going to mine... <laughs> Venus, you know, oh, wait a second. He's going to be liquid ethanol Wait rich. a second. You're on to something. It would also reduce the terraforming. The of yep. Yes. We could terraform Venus by fueling our own vehicles. <laughs> so we'd destroy this plant's atmosphere while we make that one okay. Wait a second. We have That's to have Earth, idea. too. It's like, wait a second. That's a bad idea. <laughs> That's that's an interesting concept. Um, automated facilities. Put an automated facility out there and let it run for a century, and then we're ready to go. Wow. Um, it does list itself as carbon neutral. Um, you know, Plus, it would be carbon yeah. neutral since the carbon dioxide generated from burning the ethanol would be reclaimed by the catalytic process. Mm-hmm. No word, however, on when this accidental invention will make it out of the lab. Usually it's like... A... 20 years, that kind of thing, for it to really make it into into real-world scenarios. But, you know, we did say, you know, we will go to the moon by the end of the decade. <laughs> so, you know, it, if you're properly motivated and financed, you can do nearly anything. Uh, so, yeah, I, I guess we just need a uh, an ethanol race or something, and then we could do it. I, I believe Venus needs some freedom. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe so, maybe so. Okay, and uh, the last one that we have in uh, in the science segment, uh, whose was this? This was not mine. Oh no, Nazis again? Really? <laughs> You're gonna end every segment really? on Nazis. You know, there's Is always that gonna a happen? theme. Like if if we start somewhere and it ends on a theme, that theme reoccurs. Is is this the the like Nazi moon base or something? No, the secret Nazi moon base. What what is this? Okay, I don't I know if we'll have time me. to talk about it. But there is totally a secret Nazi base <laughs> they just discovered in the Arctic, you guys. What? Seriously? There is. This, who's yeah, this? absolutely. Who's a secret one? Nazi military base in the Arctic has been discovered by Russian scientists. The site is located on the island of Alexandra Land, a thousand oh. kilometers from the North Pole. It was constructed in 1942, a year after Adolf Hitler invaded Russia. Un. Believable. Hold on, hold on, hold on. This is, I, I need to read this whole story. Um, Schatzkalabar? Where did it go? The base was abandoned when the scientists stationed there were poisoned by polar bear meat in 1944 and had to be rescued by a German U boat. This story gets better and better. They decide never eat a polar bear liver. Just letting everybody out there to know do not eat polar bear liver. It's actually poisonous. The ruins of bunkers, rusted bullets, and other relics dating from the Second World War have been discovered at the site, many of which remain in good condition, having been preserved by the cold weather. The island was vital during the Second World War as the meteorological reports it produced were essential for planning the movements of troops, submarines, and ships. And they screwed that up. A polar bear (laughs) saved Russia. From the Nazis. Yes. Literally, they had a base 
to study all of the meteorological patterns that they would have needed to invade Russia and avoid that problem they had with <laughs> Russia being soups cold. <laughs> and a polar bear saved them. Bear cavalry oh. being deployed in unconventional means nice. saved them. Look, as a person who greatly enjoys history, the <laughs> fact that we have not lauded this polar bear, I want to know is family? <laughs> I want posthumous medals? <laughs> This polar bear is important to oh. the history of our world. Wow. He needs a statue like Balto got. That'd Jews be great. may not believe in Jesus, but I bet you they believe in polar bears. Wow. <laughs> it was codenamed Schatz. The, the, the base was codenamed Schatzglaber, or Treasure Hunter, by the Germans, and was primarily used as a tactical weather station. Uh, but it may have also been for uh, looking for artifacts in addition to everything else, because Hitler was kind of crazy about finding this all the ancient stuff. That's the speculation. Yeah. Um, Russia is thought to be looking to build its own permanent military base there today. Shocking. Shock and awe. This is this is my surprise face. Well, as long as they don't eat any polar bear meat, what could go wrong? No, they'll put what it in could go wrong? What could go wrong? <laughs> That's fascinating. That's fascinating. See, you were skeptical, but you I, liked it. I was... <clears throat> <laughs> you scoffed at Nazis and you got a hero polar bear. Uh, yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Uh, You're no, welcome. Yes, thank you. No, this is wonderful. I just didn't realize that I'd be ending two segments on Nazis. <laughs>